Hey everyone, it's Kate at Finding Cooper's Voice. Hope everyone's doing great. Happy Sunday. I have a little bit of a cold, so I sound a little bit different. I'm on the mend. I typically get sick um, two or three times a winter. Um, my life is stressful. I like to think that I handle it really well, but I think um, the parts that I don't handle very well are often self-care, which I think are the two most dreaded words you can ever say to a parent of a special needs kid. Um, self-care, self-care, self-care. Yes. Very important. Um, knowing that is one thing. Doing is another. I'm working on it. I'm on the mend. Let's hope. Um, I just hope I try to stay out of the doctor and not have to go on any antibiotics. So we'll see how I'm doing in a few days. Uh, today is Sunday. Anyone that follows me regularly knows that Sundays are my serious videos. Um, I have a son, Cooper, who is six on the spectrum, nonverbal, severe. And I like to, on this blog, share all the joys and happiness that he brings into my life. I like to talk about the business side of autism, the paperwork, the phone calls, the benefits, the hell that that is. And then I like to talk about the emotions because that's something that you have to search far and wide to find. There's a lot of stigmas that go into parenting special needs kids. We feel shamed if we talk about how hard it is and how sad it can be. And um, it's my mission to talk about it. So in my sick haze last night, um, let me just say I spent the last two days at a Partners in Policy Making class. Google it. I say that every time. Google Partners in Policy Making. See when it's coming to your community, if it is. <coughs> and if it is, um, sign up. It's a class for advocacy for um, adults with disabilities and teaching them to advocate. And then it's a class for parents with kids with disabilities. And it brings us all together and we spend hours and hours and hours together and we learn how we can move the needle, make the world a better place. I love it. Two long days though. The Friday session, um, it's 10 times a year. The Friday session is like 10 30 to 9 and then yesterday till um, like 7 30 to 3 30 <coughs> and being kind of sick um, just kind of took its toll on me but I spent last night kind of bumming and I started thinking about my fears um, with having a child with a disability and how they've evolved and changed I mean when you think about fear we all have them. You either learn how to combat them or work with them or make them better. I mean, you just, or you let them overtake you. That's not my plan. So my greatest fear for Cooper will forever be what's going to happen after I die and who is going to keep him safe and love him and dress him and make sure that his waters the right temperature and make sure he's tucked in at night and that his butt is wiped and his feet are clean and he's warm and if I jump into that rabbit hole it's a lot because what's going to happen when I'm 70 and 80 and what if I'm not in good shape and what if Cooper is more violent and strong and I can't care for him I don't, at this point, want to put him in a group home. I don't want to think about a group home. So when people say it, it's not a negative. I don't mean a negative. Any parent that's done that, you're awesome. I'm not there yet. My boy's still really little. So it's just like this big, deep, dark hole that I can jump into. And what if I died sooner? What if, what if, what if, what if? Will his brother take care of him? Do I put that pressure on his brother? Sawyer's four. Should I have had more kids? Should I have had more kids to help care for Cooper? All these things go into planning for long-term care. I should be thinking about college. I'm not. Uh, that's That will forever be my greatest fear. Another huge fear... Um, that I have that's a little bit better now. I've learned to live with it and not let it creep up on me 
is what if I never hear my son's voice? I want you to think about that. Cooper has never said a spoken word to me. I've never heard the the moms, the I love yous, the why, 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 the they say the darndest things. We've never had that. And I just want to hear his voice. And what if I die and I never hear him say mom? That is a fear. It's real. It's valid. I've learned to live with that one because I know now that there's assistive technology and Cooper will learn to speak with me through his computer and there's more ways to speak than through the mouth. Tough though. But I have another fear that I don't talk about as much that's very valid and it's kind of harder to explain. So I do a lot of interviewing. Um, I interview a lot of parents that have adult children with autism, high functioning, low functioning, severe, nonverbal. Um, I had to know what adulthood looked like. Because I don't. I don't know any. Well, I do now after partners in policymaking. But before a couple weeks ago, I didn't know any adults with autism. So I dove into it. And I interviewed. And I talked. And I, I made it less scary for me. And I made it safer. And I saw joy and positivity. And I saw struggles. And I saw hard things. I needed to do that. And every parent that I interviewed, I asked a version of this question. And they all knew what I was asking. I asked them, had they ever connected with their child? And they knew what I was asking. And the parents with high-functioning kiddos said, yeah. You know, now we share art or we share yoga. That was one. We laugh over old westerns. We train hunt. And they would tell me that they'd found their connection. Some of the parents with kids with severe autism told me that they never had. They knew that their they loved their child and they knew deep down, even though their child had never showed them in return, they knew their child loved them and knew they were loved. They'd found their comfortable place. They'd gotten there. Some of the parents told me they'd never been hugged by their child. They'd never had a conversation two ways back and forth. When Cooper was two and three and four, hardest years for anyone that's in it, three's tough. Three is really tough. There's no hiding autism anymore. I broke down crying to my husband one time and I said, this is the most selfless job I'd ever done. I'm parenting, my parenting's different than all my friends parenting their kids. Their kids are meeting milestones and laughing and making friends and going on play dates and going and doing things. And Cooper and I were in doctor's offices and terrible therapy appointments. And the only interaction I'd have with Cooper would be he wanted his Wi-Fi, he wanted to be fed, he wanted his diaper changed, he wanted me to press play on his movie. And I remember I would climb in bed with him after he'd fallen asleep and I would lay behind him and I would hold him and I would beg God. I would lay there and I would beg God to help him, to, to bring him out of his head, to bring him into the world. And I would, I would make, try and bargain. I would try and make deals. And I would think if you just let him talk, I'll do anything. I'll do anything. If you just, you could make I would get so crazy, I would, and I've heard this from their parents, so I'm telling you this in a safe place, I would try and bargain, like, make me sick, or take, take something from me, make Cooper better. Well, never worked. Damn it. Um, but Cooper, um, it's better now, at age six, six was a big turning point, um, Cooper interacts more now. He has joined our world. It used to be like he was a ghost. I could always hear him, and I could see him sometimes, 
but I couldn't get him to connect with our family. I couldn't get him to come sit on the couch. I couldn't get him to come be with us or eat dinner. Or I just couldn't bring him in. A lot of hard years. It's better now. Cooper's, he moves around us more. He's in the common spaces more of our house. He's, he's made huge improvements. We have a long ways to go. I'm 34 and Cooper is six. What if we never have that connection? <laughs> this is getting long. I'm sorry. I have a story to tell you. So yesterday at Partners in Policymaking, I had lunch with an 18-year-old who had cerebral palsy. He's in a wheelchair. He's a beautiful, beautiful man, soul. I love him. He's my favorite. His mom is my superhero. She's his caregiver. And they talked to me for maybe 40 minutes, 45 minutes. And the whole time, he was touching her. And they were laughing. And they were telling each other jokes and teasing each other. And I was like, hold your shit together, Kate. Hold your shit together. Because I had tears. I'm sick, welling up in my throat. I couldn't talk at some point because they were teasing each other like they should. And I know her life is hard. I know his life is hard. They're my idols. What if I never have that with Cooper? Now I know he non-verbally loves me. I know he uses his talker. I know he hugs me when I ask. But, and you're going to tell me to say the yets. He hasn't talked yet. He hasn't hugged me on his own yet. He hasn't connected with me yet. Fine. Yet is fine. We can say that when we're advocating and when we're being positive and when we're talking to other parents. We can say the yets. But when you're sitting at home and you realize the yet might never happen, it's so hard. It's so hard. Raising a kid with a disability is so isolating. And you don't know what the future holds. And Last night was a tough night. I just want to know that when he's 20, that we can have a bond and laugh about something. We could have two-way communication. I could say something. Like he could ask me a question. He's never asked me a question. We've never had a conversation, not a real one. It's so hard, people. I want you to think about your greatest fears. I want you to think about them and say them out loud. Start by writing them down. That's what I do. I write them down and think about them. Don't feel guilty. And then talk to your spouse about them, your mom, your support system. Talk with them. Talk, talk, talk. You're not a bad parent. You're an amazing parent. You love your kid. But this stuff is real. And there is a chance that I might never hear my son speak. And it kills me. It's the truth. Have a great day, everyone. I'm going to go lay down. <laughs> so sick. I will talk to you all soon. Bye.